this vlog, but technically I kind of cheated because right now it's September. Um, last month I didn't really get a chance to take any footage actually. Um, I was, I guess, trying to live in the moment at that time, um, and like obviously when you always pull out your camera, um, it kind of takes you away from the moment and also takes away from uh, the people that you're hanging out with. Um, so I actually had a very, very nice uh, August in terms of just taking it a little bit slower because I've been traveling a lot and I'll be ramping up travel again at the end of September this month um, where I'll be going to Barcelona, Copenhagen, Lyon and Stockholm. Um, but yeah, I'm just really excited to have this chance to kind of rebuild the house a little bit, maybe I'll show a little snippet before I jump in um, to do a really quick overview of how I made my first Instagram filter um, using Spark AR Studio. Um, because I got quite a few DMs after I published my first filter um, asking me how I got started and uh, I thought that it would be good to give you guys just a really quick overview of you know how do you deal with your imported assets, what are some of the capabilities and things you could do. It's not necessarily a step-by-step -step tutorial about how I constructed my Instagram filter but I thought that it's a good starting point for you to kind of understand you know how, what, is, what is possible and what kind of uh, assets you can create um, in terms of like 3D and 2D and like particle system and logic systems and things like that. So I hope it's useful for you and then I will see you again next month. Bye! Let's take a quick look at what is the actual effect that we're looking to create. Um, you can see it on my Instagram account. This is actually in uh, kind of real time how the effect looks. So I basically create a 3D character head that uh, tracks to the uh, my head itself and then all the facial com uh, components is also tracked to like you know the locate the rough locations of where my face is. Um, and it has a particle effect that gets spawned and then when it opens the mouth uh, it gets sucked in and then with a grid background that replaces the, the real life background. So here are some of the kind of in progress uh, kind of work that I was doing to test out the system. Um, and then I do want to be pretty clear that in general, um, I, this is my first Instagram filter that I built. And so I didn't really have an end goal of what I wanted to make, uh, but rather instead I was basically trying to figure out how to, um, like how this whole system works um, and a lot of it was just like it's just some rough explorations and I landed on something that I'm relatively happy about um, I think I'll probably try to make some more later on uh, when I have do have time but uh, I just wanted to understand how this whole system works now for some of you who are asking me about like how it was actually made um, I can let you have a quick look. So it's sparkar.facebook.com is a tool that is built by Facebook um, in order for you to create uh, AR effects. Um, and I actually first got in touch with it when I was doing the AR mural with, um, uh, with Facebook. And you can see it over here in my tag section um, where we had, and South by Southware, we have professional artists. Um, where they would actually paint traditional murals and then um, me and a bunch of other two uh, AR artists would uh, create this type of different um, kind of AR uh, overlay on top of it um, and things like that. So I, the initial experience that I had with Spark AR was when it was very bare bone. Uh, it only worked on Mac um, and it was brutal for all of us artists out there because most of us use PC by now if you do anything that is 3D related. Um, but now it has both uh, Windows and Mac. So you can just download the app over here um, and it's a node-based system. So if you are familiar with things like Blueprint, um, Origami, Quartz Composer, you'll probably be fairly comfortable. Um, if not, they have a bunch of tutorials that you can go through to understand just the baseline components. Um, and it's actually pretty nice. Uh, and the great thing is that it just directly pumps into the distribution channel, which is Instagram or Facebook uh, camera. Um, and obviously for us, it's like probably the Instagram component is the most compelling one. Um, yeah. So before I jump in to break down my particular project, I thought it would be good to run over with you guys in terms of what are some of the UI component and the interface of the Spark AL tool itself. Um, and so on the far left hand side, you have a bunch of kind of system level uh, components. So you have 
kind of figuring out how to do your workspace. Um, you can play and pause the simulation over here, which I do think is awkward spatially how far away it is from the simulation. Uh, but you know, it's a choice that the designers have made. And then here is a bunch of export functionalities. Right here is your scene graph, which is super useful because it basically is a pretty good reflection of like, you know, the abstract view of like, what are some of the objects that's currently in scene and how are they actually related from a hierarchical standpoint. Um, and then you also have the asset uh, kind of folder that basically helps you to keep track of all the FBX, all the texture that you put in and all that jazz, all the materials that you created. Um, this is your viewport uh, where you can see how your scene is being laid out. This is uh, the camera component and you can see how it's being projected. Um, and that is a really good way to just in general debug, you know, where things clip and things like that. This is a very useful simulation view um, that is, let me quickly turn off the head. Let's see, turn on the head. This is the baseline video that gets played. Um, for, to help you to kind of really quickly get a feedback of um, all the different characteristics that you might want to be watching out for and testing out your logic without having to hook up your phone to every single uh, kind of iterations that you're going through. Um, so it's super helpful. Um, I basically use that to, to do most of my creation. Uh, you can also kind of change it to different devices if you wanted to test them out. And this is the patch editor, which is going to be the most interesting part for you to use um, because it's basically a way for you to establish logic and also pipe in different data um, into your AR filter. Now, I had a very hard time using this interface in particular because I feel like that it was actually designed by someone who basically uses a trackpad because the way that it did the the mapping of uh, input is that like okay i can use my scroll wheel up and down to browse the node graph vertically but if i want to view it horizontally um you actually need to hold down alt and then move your mouse wheel in order to move left and right uh, or you can just use your mouse to drag but that's just totally pointless because most node graph structure you can hold down spacebar and pan but or put down your mouse wheel to pen, but nope, it does not work. Uh, I've tried, and <laughs> but unfortunately, that is just how it is. Um, overall, the tool is relatively simple. I think a lot of the work that you have to do is actually figuring out a uh, import pipeline that works for you. So some of you are probably going to be more from a traditional 2D Illustrator background. Um, this particular filter is quite heavy on 3D because I actually really enjoy making 3D heads, so that was the goal that I went for. If you wanted to look at something that is more 2D centric, you're more than welcome to, you know, use the online tutorials that they have uh, in order to uh, understand it. So let's really quickly switch over to Blender just so that I can show you how I assemble the head. Okay, so this is uh, my Blender file. And um, since most of my um, Instagram AL filter is actually done with a 3D character, I thought I would just really quickly show you how this whole thing works. So I basically set it up right now is um, so that I can render out uh, the uh, filter icon itself. Uh, but this is the asset that was used. And as you can see here that, let me turn on overlays. So as you can see here, these are actually discrete meshes. Um, they are discrete because I wanted to make sure that I can hook them up to dynamically to a position that the face tracker provides. So the eyebrows will be where the eyebrows are and things like that. Uh, if you were to bake them out as like a whole mesh itself, which is what most characters are usually baked out as, uh, you would not be able to populate um, the kind of the components of the meshes. So the eyes, the eyebrows um, in relation to the correct position in that is being registered from the camera. Um, and one of the other things that like is good to note is that I actually a lot of times just use um, the EV engine as just like a really quick previous of like what is the overall aesthetic or color scheme that I want to go for. And the one thing to note is that we all know that, you know, to be honest, like every single render engine is going to be different. And so the Spark AR Studio engine does not have the kind of same aesthetic as what you will be able to create in EV. And so a lot of times it's just an exercise for me to practice is like, okay, this is the general composition or the, the color aesthetic that I'm going for. And then when I jump into Spark AL Studio, 
uh, I would basically um, readjust and try to recreate the look, but nothing is ever going to be solidly perfect, but it's usually a good starting point. And yeah. So going back into Sparky L Studio, I basically, the first thing first that I did was that I knew that I wanted to track the face. And in order for me to do that, I basically uh, added a face tracking component. So the way that you go about doing is that you select the focal distance, you create add, and you add a face tracker. Um, and obviously this is specific to if you do want to do a face filter, you would use the face tracker, but if you want to do something based on service or specific target or hands or whatever, you use the correct tracker through that. Um, and what I did was I created a face tracker and that gives me an opportunity to basically, oh, I forgot how, how hard it is to navigate through this. Um, you created the face tracker, it gives you an opportunity to essentially, uh, expose a certain data uh, to your uh, node graph so that you can hook up things. So I basically imported the head, which has a whole bunch of other uh, child components that I added. So like for example, the nose and the eyebrows. The eyebrows are a really good example where I basically um, pulled out a node from the face part of the face tracker. And then I selected face line marks, which has a bunch of other components there. And I used uh, the eyebrow one where I can track the position, which is a vector three component um, of both the left eyebrow and the right eyebrow. And then I dynamically hook them up to their position. Um, and the way that you would allow the um, kind of the node system to drive a certain parameter in your asset is that you can select one of these icons and once you press those, so for example for scale, I can press that and it will pop up as a patch and then you can just hook them up to the correct uh, kind of endpoint uh, for yourself. Um, so this is how I actually populated a lot of the facial features and there are certain things that I also looked out for. So for example for the eyelid, I was specifically looking out for how open are the eyes. Um, and uh, that gives me kind of a scale of value which basically oscillates between 0 to 1. Um, it means that you can then map a certain attribute or a certain property um, based on that transition. So I would start off with like maybe at this particular scale and then it would increase in size to this particular scale. I mostly change the y value um, so that it allows it to create this illusion of blinking. Um, and that applies to both the left eye and the right eye. Now, for a slightly more complex thing, and a lot of the kind of the effect of this AR filter is driven by how open and closed your mouth is. Uh, the first thing first that I did was actually um, I used the mouth openingness, which is a zero to one progress, to drive a lot of the transitions. But what I find is that um, using that makes it really hard because it gets really easily triggered. It's very sensitive because sometimes your mouth might just be open for a little bit and you don't want to have too drastic of an ex uh, kind of like a transition. So I clamped it to a value to 0 0.4 to 1. So that only if the mouth opens to at least 0 0.1 uh, openness, then it will kick in all the transitions. So, you know, it will change the mouth scale. It will basically create the background uh, animated um, kind of canvas um, and then it also helps to trigger a bunch of kind of where the things are visible um, and things like that. One of the big things that I did was that I uh, created a, this emitter which is a particle system that is currently tracked to the, um, the face itself um, and I have it so that I have it set so that um, these kind of 2D sprites of these are kind of stars are always facing the camera um, because at the end of the day these are 2D sprites so facing the camera means that they're always aligned appropriately um, but one of the big things that I did was actually uh, applied a transition to the force so when the person has his mouth closed what happens is that the particle will disperse uh, at a very like, kind of like a low rate so it will be around 0.01 um, but then once they open the mouth, we actually increase the force that's being applied to it by about a thousand times um, so that it looks like as though that they're sucking into the person's mouth. Um, and that's basically how I use the dynamic kind of force system of particles to create a certain effect. 
Um, and then in addition to it, I also hooked up a switch so that I can track whether the person is opening their mouth or not. And when they are opening the mouth, I play an animated sequence. So to make this clearer, let me turn off the head. You can see this grid is actually animating. Um, it pushes out and it reverses back when you close the mouth. Um, and that's basically just like a fun thing that I was testing. I was trying to understand the animated sequence properly. It's a texture that gets created, um, that I created in Blender, in fact, um, where I animated a wireframe mesh and then pushed it outwards. Um, and then I generated a bunch of PNG sequence for it. Um, and that created a really interesting exercise for me of like understanding how you would create this particular texture. So let me quickly look at this asset and show you the materials. Now, you can clearly tell I'm someone who's like very well disciplined in naming my uh, assets. Um, I sometimes have these odd habits where I still follow the some of the Unreal convention like M underscore and MI underscore, but obviously in this case it's not relevant, you know. I just put down material to, or like I just use the default name. Um, and in here you can see that uh, I created an animation sequence, if you double click on there. Uh, it's basically an imported a series of PNGs. Um, and I selected on this particular icon to activate it as a um, as a parameter, which I drive the frame transition from zero to thirty, so that it will push out anime and then elastic back when you close your mouth. Um, that was really really fun. But here is kind of like the next tip that I want to talk to you about, which is uh, when you are preparing to export. Um, uh, they have a very handy menu that basically helps you to calculate whether this particular uh, kind of uh, effect that you've created fit within their uh, parameters. So in this case, uh, they have to all fit within like, you know, uh, this particular size. And when I was trying to do the export, uh, it would keep failing. And even in the case where I was like just wanting to test out how it looked, uh, when I try to send it to the app, uh, which is to the Instagram camera, it just keeps failing and I wasn't quite sure what was what was going on so I looked at this tab which is super helpful as the asset summary that allows me to keep track of understanding is like well which part is getting really bloated because at first I was under the impression that the hair would be the really problematic one because it was a meta ball and I think that I didn't really do a lot of optimization in terms of controlling the level of uh, faces that existed in that FBX so I thought that that might be bloating it up but actually in fact I forgot that I had this animated texture, which actually had a pretty large file size. And I, like, it came to across to me as, like, oh, that was actually the thing that I needed to optimize through this um, kind of uh, table view. And they have this really handy tool, which is the manual compression uh, for textures that I can select, like, you know, the target devices in terms of how much I want to compress. And that was how I get the file size down. So you can see here that, like, the initial file size is, like, gigantic. And, and then, like, after the if's been compressed, it has reduced quite significantly. And that was actually how I got through the pipeline. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically the general gist of, you know, how you can get started with making your own Instagram filter. I had tons of fun. Um, I think there's still a lot of things that we probably need to figure out in terms of like how to make things look better. Like I'm still a process of trying to understand the shader system a little bit better so that I can create the aesthetic that I personally enjoy. Um, but it's overall, it's actually really easy to get started and build something that is relatively dynamic. Um, so I definitely would encourage people to try it out and see how it goes. Um, if you need any other helps, feel free to just send me an email uh, or just leave a comment or send me a direct message in uh, Instagram. So yeah, 